We're impressed by comedians that can do impressions and comedians that can do more than just make us laugh. To possess more than one talent is nearly unbelievable. George Kirby was one of those artists that few know about, but his talent was limitless. Kirby's abilities earned him mass appeal, TV and movie appearances along with an endless stream of club gigs. However, because the culture of comedy shifted in the mid-70s, it left Kirby without a place to fit in. With TV appearances drying up and the gaps between gigs getting larger, it led to Kirby's own downfall, where he turned to a life of crime in order to support himself. Hey, it's me, Rodney Perry, and this is a story you should know. George Kirby was born June 8, 1923 in Chicago. His mother was a singer and his father was a musician, so entertaining was in his blood from the beginning. Kirby grew up on the south side of Chicago. Interestingly enough, Louis Armstrong was his neighbor. After having moved to Chicago from New Orleans, Louis Armstrong would go on to become one of Kirby's most famous impressions. He would even play him in an episode of a variety series, Dolly, in 1988. Kirby spent a lot of his childhood on the road with his parents in show business. As a result, he was absent from school, which caused him to drop out of Wendell Phillips High School at the end of his sophomore year. Kirby worked several odd jobs in order to support himself. These jobs included dishwashing and bartending. The latter gave him the opportunity to perform on stage for the first time. Kirby also served in the U.S. Army during World War II. After serving for three years, he returned to Club DeLisa and became a featured performer. Their shows contained a variety show format where singers, dancers, and comedians would perform. Kirby had the talent to perform in every segment. He was a jazz piano player, a singer, stand-up comedian, but was most known for his impressions. John Wayne and Clark Gable, Louis Armstrong, and Nat King Cole were some of his favorites. One thing that made Kirby stand out from the rest was his ability to pull off impressions of famous white stars as well. This is Scott McCarthy, who won a fight tonight. The brown bomb emerged victorious once again. We're trying to get the microphone on Joe. Joe, tell me, what do you think was a punch that did it? Okay, okay. I'll go. I'll start off. Okay, pal, as the great one would say. Now, sweet it in! Yeah. <laughs> James Cagney, he was always great, Dan. His voice is more like this. If you see me right time, you'll know what I'm talking about. He wasn't afraid to take on women as he impersonated Ella Fitzgerald with ease. He was truly one of a kind. It wasn't too long before Kirby left Chicago for New York to live out his dream. There he became a regular performer at the 845 Club. Kirby was one of the first black comedians to appeal to both white and black audiences during the Civil Rights era. Part of this was due to singer Bobby Darren insisting that Kirby be the opening act at the club Copacabana. At the time, the club was known for not allowing non-headlining blacks to perform or to be in the showroom at all. After the two performed, the club changed their policy and helped Kirby attract mixed audiences. Kirby continued to gain popularity and began to create a fan base for himself. He was on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1949 in one of his first television appearances. The Jackie Gleason Show, The Tonight Show with Steve Allen, Jack Park, and Johnny Carson, as well as The Jerry Lewis Show and The Dean Martin Show, Kirby was riding high on success. In 1952, Kirby started performing on The Count Basie Show and became one of the first black performers to play Las Vegas. This was at a time where black entertainers weren't allowed to sleep, gamble, or change clothes in the hotel where they performed. Despite this, Kirby's success continued to grow. His act wasn't vulgar or risque. However, the stress of success started to get to Kirby, and he developed a heroin addiction by the end of the decade. In 1958, Kirby was arrested in a drug raid and was on probation for three years. Struggling with his addiction, Kirby committed to a drug rehabilitation center. Kirby was released in 1960 and started performing again. The owners of clubs in Michigan and New York, Art Bags and Sarah Vaughn, were significant in helping Kirby restart his career. Throughout the 60s, Kirby continued to perform around the country and even got the chance to perform overseas. A critic from the Washington Post wrote a review of his act in 1967. They read, Kirby's singing voice is excellent. His impressions are nearly flawless. His material is in perfect taste. As a Negro, he muses racial stories deftly and with the bemused eye for the foibles of both whites and Negroes. In 1972, Kirby got one of his biggest breaks by getting a consistent gig on television. He became a regular on ABC's Comedy Hour, part of a group, the Copycats, who were impressionists. Along with Kirby was Rich Little, Frank Gorshin, Joe Baker, 
Marilyn Michael, and Fred Travelina. The show only lasted 13 episodes before cancellation. Despite cancellation, executives knew the star power that Kirby possessed. Up next, the George Kirby Comedy Hour debuted in the fall of 1972. Kirby led his own half-hour variety show. Most knew Kirby as a master impressionist, but having his own show gave him the opportunity to show off his singing abilities as well. The show was also canceled after one season on air. The show was expected to turn Kirby into a household name. By the mid-70s, audiences started to become accustomed to comedy with a social satire and humor that was a little risque. During this time, Richard Pryor had started to burst through the scene with his off-the-wall albums. The desire for truth-telling commentary was one factor that led to Kirby's lack of club bookings and TV appearances. Kirby instead turned to drug dealing in order to catch up on bills and to support his habit and lifestyle. In 1977, Kirby sold drugs to an undercover police officer in Las Vegas. According to the New York Times, Kirby was arrested with eight others in four raids. Police said that a half a million dollars worth of heroin, cocaine, and marijuana was confiscated. Kirby was charged with selling more than one pound of heroin to an undercover agent. The single transaction was worth $26,000. During the trial, Kirby confessed to using his comedy career as a cover for drug dealing. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but only served three and a half at Terminal Island outside of Los Angeles, California. After his release, Kirby possessed a new outlook on life. He continued performing, this time with an anti-drug message, warning the youth about his experiences. George Kirby presents King Heroin. I'm King Heroin, known to all as the destroyer of man. From when I first came, nobody knows. In 1982, Kirby took the stage before a packed crowd and said, Yes, I'm back again. On the road again, I've paid some heavy dues, my friend. I ain't doing nothing wrong again. After the performance, Kirby said the audience made him seem like he was never away. After his release from prison, Kirby never returned to the heights of fame that made him a recognizable name. He had guest appearances on shows like Fame, Murder, She Wrote, 227, and What's Happening Now. He also had a small part in the film Leonard Part 6, starring Bill Cosby. His last television appearance came in 1992, where he had a small role in the film You Must Remember This. Kirby was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in the early 90s. In 1995, a tribute was held at the Debbie Reynolds Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. This was to help pay for medical expenses after Kirby's insurance ran out. Unfortunately, Kirby would pass away several months later in September of that same year. Kirby's story isn't one that you hear too often, but it's one that needs to be told. There aren't many who know his story, but while Kirby was on his road to success, he was able to pave the way for many of the famous impressionists you see today.